Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. With your hosts, Lonnie Lowry. Remember, Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree held together with scar tissue and bone spurs. Rob Fortney. And I'm telling you, the pain that I would suffer was ex- beyond excruciating. And Phil Stevens. Do it, Rob. You'll kill all those nerves. Thanks for listening. Welcome, Iron Radio listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry. I'm an exercise physiology and sports nutrition professor, and I'm a former competitive bodybuilder. And this is Phil Stevens. I'm a strength coach. I run Strength Guild. I'm a power lifter. Soon to be competing again here in about five weeks. So Nice. Yeah, getting ready to go. Nice. I'm Dr. Mike T. Nelson. I own Extreme Human Performance, a faculty member at the Kerrig Institute, and now just launched the Flex Diet Nutrition Certification. Oh, what's that about? Uh, it's basically a combination of flexible dieting and metabolic flexibility. And just trying to look at all the, I've broken down into eight components. You'll take and learn one component per week. So there'll be a theory-based part and there'll be a practical-based uh, module. Trying to get some other experts and stuff possibly as bonus interviews too. And yeah, so the nice part is as a coach, you'll learn exactly what to do for nutrition, but <clears throat> it's more flexible, meaning the client will kind of lead you through the process within some parameters. So I equate it to like, if you ever go bowling, you kind of, you're the coach, you would inflate the little bumpers on the, the side of the bowling alley. So you kind of force them to stay in the alley and not the, the lane, two lanes down, um, but allow the clients to kind of wander uh, a little bit so they can kind of eventually get to their their goal hmm. cool that was not a yeah. planned ad everyone i just <laughs> i wanted no, to know <laughs> I <just> threw it in. <laughs> i literally put the thing up yesterday in terms of the opt-in but yeah i'm working on it for quite a while oh sweet yeah all right we've got a little bit of uh news and mail and then if you want to stick around everyone i hope you do we're only a few minutes in uh we're going to talk about giving back like, what are some of the qualities that lifters possess that might help us give back? So, uh, we kick off the fall funds drive this week, essentially, because, you know, fall is hitting, the leaves are turning, people's thoughts turn to giving. So, uh, we are talking about sort of other ways, maybe, uh, to give back instead of just donating money. So, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, but first, to the mail and news... Strength and Muscle Sport News. I'll start with a piece of mail we got. Uh, and listeners, I don't know if you, we've ever said this before, but I don't. I usually don't tell Mike or Phil, like, you know, here's the, here's the question coming at you. This is so seat of the pants what we do. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It's that kind of low prep um, flexibility, to use a, a Mike Nelson word, uh, yeah. that, that keeps us on the air every week, you know, because uh, so many podcasts, they have huge production values. They do all this super cool stuff. And then they last for like, they pod fade in three weeks, you know? So, um, so low prep. So uh, forgive us for this, but anyway, this, we've been getting a lot of mail and I don't know where this is coming from. Maybe it's, you know, it's just some sort of viral internet thing, but, um, with like PR and social media people asking to be on our show or to somehow use or partner with iron radio in different ways. Uh, anyway, so we could talk about this on and off the mic here, but this was sent by, uh, Lucas. He says, hi, iron radio crew. I'm a PR guy working for hammer strength. So, Mm. okay. So that got my interest. I'm reaching out to pitch you. He's, he's honest. Uh, a couple of news stories from the company pertaining to strength conditioning community. Um, the bottom line is, he says, uh, one of these items pertains to an annual Hammer Clinic series. Uh, they have them around North America between the months of January and May. So I guess this could be sort of a news tidbit for people. They're doing Hammer Strength or Hammer Clinics, they're called. I haven't done one. I don't, Phil, have you ever done anything like hmm. that? A hammer? Mm-mm. Huh. Uh, it says they're working on planning their next wave of clinics. I'm curious if you guys would be interested in attending, maybe recording some interviews with some of the experts or 
uh, even speaking yourself, essentially, would you be interested? So I'll follow up with you guys after we, you know. Yeah. Um, Sounds like it'd be kind of fun. Turn off the, the record button. Yeah. Uh, like I said, it caught my eye when he said, oh, hammer strength. I mean, my gym's full of a lot of hammer strength stuff. And I, I sometimes use that. I think as far as the, the quote-unquote oh, yeah. machines go, very, very clever stuff. So. Uh, yeah, my my to... favorite one is the <clears throat> the one they have. It's like a high row where you have the you sit down in the seat. It's like a lat back exercise one. Yeah, um, that's yep. like one of my favorite machines. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. We have like um, I think bodybuilders gym has four different hammer like different types of row. There's like a horizontal. Mm -hmm. There's the high row. There's like a low row. Like every angle of your traps and lats, you just which by the way. Achievements in training. <laughs> I am wrecked. Phil will be proud of me. My fr my, my mm. anterior muscles not so sore. My back, my my ass, my hamstrings wrecked. <laughs> so what'd you do? Uh, well, I just got back. I, I was sick for a week, and you know I know you don't completely detrain, but I I think I must have been so uh, sort of immobile. I just had a freaky, I think, I think it was that hand, foot, and mouth infection because I had some rash on my hands yeah. and my feet. It was really weird. And you know what? I, and I know listeners like, oh, God, that's so true. If there's ever anything wrong with your hands, nothing will shut down your lifting. Like, you can't grab a oh, barbell. Yeah. And so I had these sort of sores. It was just not good. Thank God they're faded now. And I just must not have been exposed to this. I guess babies get this a lot. So I'm kind of laughing at the, about that, but. Uh, so I couldn't lift like at all for I don't know eight days, and I just got back in the gym and I I overdid set after set. Uh, I, I mean I was doing shrugs and stuff like that, but uh, I love seated cable rows. I just love them. I mean oh, yeah. people can make fun of you know different machines and maybe it's not the equivalent of deadlifting that kind of stuff, but nothing wrecks my my lats and my mid back like seated cable rows. I love them, and I overdid it and I am just I am just wrecked. I'm just wrecked. So I'm not going to go through my whole workout, but I was happy about that. Um, nice. While we're on the topic, though, of achievements in training, for me, it was really just getting back into it. I mean, I had a ball just getting sore. You know, I, I still like to train like that sometimes. So, But, Phil, if you're going to compete, uh, tell us about your training right now. Oh, man, I'm training different than I ever have. Um, basically, well, I posted it the other day. Um, the, the new fad... It seems is like you're seeing lots of like squat every day, this and that. Like frequency has yes. become the new fad. Yep. And I'm like training once a week. <laughs> so it's the opposite of that. <clears throat> I have one day where I go in and I do some bench and stuff like that. And then other days I might do a little a little rowing, this and that. But I mean, I, it's nothing that I would consider training on those six days of the week. Um, I'll just hit a little of this or that, 10 minutes or whatever. But the primarily 99% of my training is all done one day. Um, hmm. And then I have a, the rest of the week to recover. Um, and it's working for me right now. For where I'm at, um, I'm consistently getting stronger. So, um, yeah, and I, part of it was to do with I think just these injuries, I think, is, is a part of it. Age is another part. But I was trying to go back. After the hip, after the hamstring, I went back to trying to do the traditional like powerlifting split where okay you got deadlift day and then several days later now you have squat day and basically i was just always in a state of disrepair and pain mm. um so none of the days were great so i was like well i'm gonna try just putting it all i'm gonna do all my squatting all my polling uh, on one day um Oof. and i started that and you know, it, it was tough at first, especially because you go in and you do your heavy, squ heavy squatting and then like, okay, four minutes later, now it's time to start warming up the deadlift. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but I'm used to it now. And like the other day I went in and hit the heaviest, the heaviest pause squat I've ever hit, uh, ever. Um, nice. You mean my, even, you know, even pre-surgery? Pre-surgery. Yeah. Everything. So hey. I've never hit one bigger. And then, uh. Like 15 minutes later, I pulled 6:30. So wow. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's it's starting to work well, and I still doubt it. I think because it's still so new to me, and it just feels wrong. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I'm trying to uh, not ignore the uh, the results. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's it's I'm trying something new in myself. None of my other people are doing this. Yeah. I mean, which is usually what I do. It's like okay, I'm gonna try something, so I will try it, and if it 
goes down in a flaming ball of crap, then I won't have them do it. If if it works, okay, let's have one or two other people try it. But uh, and talking to some others that are, you know, I don't want to call us old, but uh, more mature and <laughs> been in the game longer. Uh, so I I don't think it's it's necessarily just age, but I think it's just how long you've been strong. Um, I think we can get away with it. Oh yeah, uh, training age. It, yeah, yeah. It takes less. You know, we can we can do more. Uh, and you're moving more weight, and then you know we don't need to do it as often to maintain and even make some some advancements. Uh, so I think that's kind of where it's playing out, and we'll see. I mean, I started messing around a few days. I've went in and just done like really light speed work on another day for 10, 15 minutes um, for like speed poles or something like that. But uh, yeah, 99% of my stuff is all done on that one day, and then I'll have another day while I do my benching. Uh, which takes, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes. And then, like I said, I try and fit in the other stuff where I can, my rows and my my things like that, some chin-ups. But those are in like five to 15-minute sessions you know, where yeah. I just have this time and it, it, I'm busy. So between the gym and everything else. But it's not hard to pick up a barbell. Like if somebody's doing 275 for something, I'll just grab it and do some rows. Yeah. You know, I right. can walk by it and just go. Hey, well, uh, now let me ask you. So, I mean, obviously we have thousands of people listen. Uh, mm. Is this unique to Phil? Is this something if they're middle-aged and they're feeling wrecked all the time, they they might want to try try this for a while? Or do you think your experience, you know, and your education and all this is allowing you to, to, to make these No, tweaks? I mean, I think it might be worth a shot, especially if you're, you know, you're feeling beat up. I think we can get away. I don't know. And this comes from, like, everybody, it's no secret me and Windler talk a lot. Um and one of his big things is doing as little as you can to still make progress instead of doing a lot of people have taken the opposite approach lately. And it's like, we're going to do as much as we can to barely not be wrecked. <laughs> <You know? laughs> do as much as we possibly can to not die. You know, <laughs> and this is the opposite. Whereas you're doing little as you can to still make progress. Um, and but the I, difference, I feel amazing. I the you difference know, I though feel is really good. But you're not so. trying to add in high frequency with with that, right? You no. know, like so many of the guys, like that's very popular. I've heard some students. In fact, one of our one of the kids last year, he was uh, trying out for a bunch of NFL teams. He was really a a, a great athlete, and he was so into the ba- basically like ninety percent squats like every day. You yeah. know, and Oof. and I'm at ninety percent. Well, real heavy, 85, 90, but the Pretty whole heavy, thing is yeah. brief. Like, kind of, it made me think yeah. about it when Phil's like, but not, but before you get wrecked, right? But then it feels yeah, like yeah, be- gotcha. because you're keeping it brief, there, and there's not too many sets. I mean, this isn't like the Andy Fry stuff that, where they're doing what, like 10 one rep maxes yeah, every yeah. day. Yeah. But they would go in, warm up, and they're, they're young, right? So, uh, again, mm-hmm. it sounds like a curmudgeon, but they're less likely, <laughs> at least, to pull something badly i think just yes. with some minimal warm up maybe one intermediate set and then they just they do a, a damn heavy squat and it was like squat every day thing and but that's not what you're talking about Phil you're talking about stacking a bunch of stuff in one workout and actually making the days per yep. week frequency low right yeah the whole the, the 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 whole frequency is not that big you know my one session is long it's like 3 hours mm mm-hmm. mhm um, of nothing but squatting and pulling and then maybe some leg press and stuff, some ab work at the end. But uh, it's primarily a 90, 90% big lifts, squats and deadlifts, and heavy. Uh, Interesting. So, and then, then, like I said, I'm pretty wrecked come Sunday. And, uh, but, I mean, by midweek, I'm good. And then I have still have Thursday, Friday, Saturday, to recover yeah. so uh, yeah, from days. That, and i'm ready to go again yeah just days and days um, to recover yeah i think the only down part to it would be if you have a bad day like last week i guess you know i could consider it a bad day it was a, my first off week in a little while and things just felt heavy i got a whole nother week to dwell mm, on that yeah <laughs> you know? yeah but uh but still i mean it wasn't that bad i mean i still went in and hit 575 for a few on squat and like 600 on deadlift so i mean i can't like, yeah, I'd take it. A, yeah, <laughs> a bad day, but I mean, even my bad days aren't that bad. Uh, so, yeah. And I think another thing to remember, though, is I think it's a lot easier to hold on to things than it is to gain them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you have to remember, like, lean. 
I just got done cutting down and I was like a lean 230. That's pretty freaking big. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm carrying I'm carrying a considerable amount of muscle mass. So and now I'm like 270. So I've been eating and uh so to hang on to that is a lot easier than like if, if I was trying to move up a weight class or something like that or I needed to gain a considerable amount of muscle, probably not the right way to go. Yeah. But as far as just peaking for a strength event, I feel good. Yeah. You know, I'm not making any massive gain sizes or anything. I don't have the volume for it. You know, that's but a, my it's a good feel point. amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? I think um, I was. There's always that deb- debate about hypertrophy being obviously the principal way you get mass, but then the very slow hyperplastic activity and satellite cell activation. And I've seen some estimates from animal models and stuff. It might only be one percent a year, but think about it. If you've done this for thirty years, you may have thirty percent more. You could call it whatever you want: nuclear domain, uh, muscle mass, yeah. whatever, uh, and. Be able to maintain that. Yeah, I'm sure we've talked yeah. about that before. Breaking new ground yeah. requires crazy volume and or different things. Yes. You know, different overload techniques. But you mm-hmm. don't really have to worry about that too much. No, you know? I just need to. You know, basically the biggest thing I needed to do, even after all the surgeries, it was all still there. Yeah, you know? <laughs> I need to learn how to use it again, right? And use it in a new way because I move differently. Like my ang- my my left uh, calf muscle still gets like rocked tight because now I don't I I don't like shift on that foot. I actually use the foot like a foot. So I have yeah. ankle flexion. Yeah. I walk normal. Mm. And oh man, that my ankle got so tight and it's still even from squats, it'll be like very fatigued my calf after squats. And I'm trying to work on that, but I mean, like I said I'm moving in a totally new way, so it was learning that. Like I need re-education. to education. Yeah. I had to turn things back on and uh you know, the best way to do it was, and then I'd get really sore. Uh, and I mean, I'm, I'm traveling ground that potentially no one ever has as far as like squatting 700 on a false hip. Yes. So, Hey, I, I almost <laughs> hesitate to tell you this, Phil, so. but because this is like gas on, on the flame, because you're very aggressive with a lot of that kind of stuff. And yeah. like you said, breaking new ground, but, uh, I was having a talk about, um, uh, joint replacement and that kind of stuff with some of the, the PT students. And um, we were looking at some literature about how well titanium fuses with bone. Mm-hmm. Like as a material, oh, yeah. some of the stuff that they're using is really, really good. You know, so I, I'm not saying, oh, just <laughs> go lean on that as much as you can, Phil, because, I mean, you are in uncharted territory, you know, because, yeah. I mean, like you said, if something goes bad, something really weird would happen, I, I think. Yeah, you know? if it goes bad, it's going to go real bad. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, I mean, if this thing turns out well, who knows, maybe like the Striker company will sponsor me. There you something. go. <laughs> there you go. Sponsored by Depew Implants. It's yeah. Funny. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I feel good, and that's the only worry ever in my head is like, the weight doesn't scare me, the this and that doesn't scare me. It's like, can the implant hold up to what I wanted to do? You know, wait and, for someone to come out of the woodwork and say, "Oh, Phil has an unfair advantage because of the the, the, the titanium." <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know, okay, yeah, the titanium joint. Yeah, um, actually, we have a listener mail that's related to that, but yeah, I wait for someone to do that, right? They're, they're, they feel a little bit beaten by you, and then they're going to be like, "Yeah, oh, he's but no, got I mean, an unfair advantage." Yeah, with what I'm doing, it's interesting because I've, now I've had a few other people you come up to me and ask me what I'm doing and this and that and. Because they're, you know, in their 40s as well. And a lot of the people that I started with were now <laughs> in our 40s. Right. Oh, yeah. You know, and we're still doing it. And uh, they're feeling the same way I was, beat up. And I was like, well, maybe after this meet, we'll uh, help me out and we'll try some of this too. Uh, oh, little experiment. It's something that there's something to be said about feeling good again and not just oh, feeling that's like huge. So. Get right on. Before I get oh, yeah. to the next mail, what about you, Dr. Nelson? Any kind of... Uh achievements in training i know you travel so much but have you been able to focus Uh, on anything yeah so i actually hired a coach about two months ago aaron davis so shout out to him trained adapt evolve and just trying to work more on uh, metabolic stuff so i flew down there to austin and did uh, an assessment using the moxie device so moxie can actually look at uh, muscle oxygen levels so you've all seen like you're in the hospital you've got the little thing they put on your finger Right to tell you uh, blood uh, saturation levels, so mm-hmm. arterial levels, like pulse ox so this, or whatever. Yeah, pulse ox, mm-hmm. exactly. Uh, so this is a similar idea, but they're using it to kind of target the the muscle. 
So you can put it on and you kind of put this little cover over it <clears throat> and it'll tell you live as you're doing exercise what's going on with the uh, local oxygen levels there. So you can then use that for programming of training. So maybe if you're doing like a super high level uh, strength exercise, at some point the muscle should kind of occlude on its own for a period of time. Um, you can then also look at, uh, so rep work, you can look at how much oxygen can get loaded and then how much can actually get offloaded at that point too. So in my case, the loading was pretty good, but the <clears throat> offloading, the desaturation was only like 30%. So I'm basically kind of, I still have a range that I can go to basically strip off more of the oxygen for that. Oh, all right, let me ask you then. So is this more of a um, open up your vascular beds thing or do you need more mitochondrial mass so you can extract that oxygen and offload it? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I don't know, to be honest. Um, so what I've been doing is just a mix of kind of some strength work and then a bunch of different protocols using a rower primarily. Um, so a lot of more, I'd say, lower intensity stuff for longer periods of time. Um, I don't know which is the exact mechanism that's limiting, to be honest, but that's something I'm actually trying to figure out to see if there's a way you can look at that, which I imagine there probably is. Um, yeah, so the other part, too, that it's it's so obvious, it's like, oh, yeah, I've known for quite a while I probably need to do more aerobic stuff because I'd only do, yeah, maybe once or twice a week at right, best. Yeah. But I just didn't get it done on my own. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then especially if I would do it, yeah, I would tend to fall back into the same kind of moderate range. I was always kind of doing the same thing, even though I knew I should probably have more variety than that, right? So I'd either do a pretty high intensity session or I do super low intensity. I didn't really do much in the, the middle area. So yeah, so I've been working on that, doing a few more, did some front squats with the clean grip again yesterday, and then uh, still working on some grip stuff. So working up to doing the Thomas inch dumbbell replica at some point. So just playing around with the hundred pound replica right now. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. Th maybe that's an argument for just um, don't ignore your aerobic base. You know, yeah, the adaptations would be more mitochondria, more capillaries. I don't know. I didn't realize that local, local, uh, like um, oxygen extraction and stuff, the kind of stuff you're talking about, would uh, be something that would vary that much and you could measure. But it's yeah. an interesting angle for sure. Yeah, I was pretty shocked at that. Um, I followed the guy who came up with the device. For about six years now, he's actually local here. So when I was at a design and medical devices conference, he was actually presenting. And same thing you said, like I didn't, I didn't think there'd be that much variability from one person to the next. Right. But yep. it makes sense. And pretty much most of the other parameters, we know that there's a pretty high level of variability. Um, and the nice part is that you can look at it, you can figure out kind of what their limiting is. It'll tell you blood flow through that area and everything too. Um, yeah, I mean, you can even put up to, like, three sensors on one test if you want and get kind of fancy. But, cool. um, yeah, so that's something I've been trying to figure out, too, because I think the misnomer of this exercise is, you know, very super high percent uh, anaerobic, right, and you're not using oxygen first. But when you look at some of the data, you'll see that oxygen gets depleted super fast at times. Interesting. So I think there's more to having a really good aerobic base for actually anaerobic performance right especially repeated bout performance um and strength coaches have known that for a while but i think it's more tied in than even what i would have thought before um joey antonio had just posted something i think it was on instagram he's doing these little like um almost infographic things about recent studies or like mini reviews they're really pretty cool through the international society of sports nutrition and whatnot but um, it it actually alluded to what you're saying that they were they were the question was something like sh should I do cardio during my you know strength gain phases or something he was showing that mm -hmm. some actual cardio and I don't just mean just the super slow stuff right but something like cardiovascular maybe a little high intensity interval work or something after your weights or whatever uh, led to better gains and i don't know if they were in noobs or intermediates or what but it does sort of beg the question I, and i think his conclusion in that was that he was sort of trying to educate the public was some is good 
obviously you don't want to mm-hmm. overdo it because then you're back to like Phil says, the man chasing two rabbits doesn't eat or whatever. Um, but some is probably good, and I can tell you that's been my biggest flaw over the years is ignoring that that aerobic base, you know, like the cardiovascular challenge because I love negatives and stuff like that, and they're not very metabolically demanding, you know. I mean, no. as far as cardiovascular stuff, so. It's yeah, cool. the, cool. the simplest for listeners, like one of the simplest templates I've used with clients, if they need kind of a mix of both is, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, do some type of lifting, probably starts with just a, a full body lift, maybe bench squat, deadlift, you know, once per day. And then Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, just to do, depending on where they're at, maybe one high intensity and the other ones are pretty low to moderate in intensity, but slowly just keep pushing out that duration. So that you get some cardiovascular, you get some strength, and you're kind of pulling them out on separate days. So if there was any interference effect, which, again, in people who are newer, is going to be more minimal, Mm -hmm. um, you're moving that to a separate day also. Because there's a couple studies looking at just moderate intensity cardio for long periods of time directly and immediately after strength training uh, can impede those gains a little bit. This is not very scientific, but I feel better somehow metabolically cleaner for lack of a better word when i have a better aerobic base and i have one oh, now. Yeah. i feel better all the time as opposed to when i would only do really brief you know it's hypertrophy effective stuff but metabolically i just didn't i felt kind of sluggish and now that i'm doing some of the high intensity interval stuff um I, i'm moving better weights and there, there's no way it's taking from my 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 progress in the gym you know, because I'm not overdoing it, but mm-hmm. yeah, anyway. the two times in my life I felt the absolute worst, excluding any injuries or anything like that, was uh, one time years ago where I read that oh, cardio is gonna screw up your strength training. So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna stop doing cardio. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I did that for four months, and I remember working at the med tech company, walking in with my cooler in my backpack, and I literally got one morning to like the second set of stairs and started breathing heavily. <laughs> And thinking, this is horrible. What the hell am I doing? I'm not that much stronger. I'm not really any stronger than I was before. And I look back at all my notes, and I'm like, I felt like dog shit for like eight weeks. Yeah, there's something (laughs) to it, you know. Yeah. Okay, we have one last piece of mail. This is a little bit lengthy. Uh, I'll get to this right now, and then we'll go to break. It says, this is from Pete. Um, Hey, guys. Uh, I'm a supporting member, and I love your show. It's very informative, and that emphasis is not mine, um, and taught me plenty about strength training. I'm fairly new to weights. Uh, I did a little in high school, but I was always more into the, the big team sports. Later in life, around 32 years old, I started running, and that did well for me, but the stress fractures and episodes of tendonitis took its toll. Mm-hmm. Um, oh. I think we all know that on some level, if you get too excited about some of this stuff you know this is sort of to your point about getting in some cardio but when you over i i honestly think running is really hard on the body it it all can be depending on your mechanic a lot of my major injuries like i think about last summer when i blew out my meniscus on my left knee i'm still i don't want to have surgery yet but there's no doubt i did so and that was doing what it wasn't it wasn't the gym it was trying to go for a run you know so listeners are probably like duh lowry you know but um, anyway, <laughs> I tried, and it, I can't. <laughs> you know, just not built for it, like you said, biomechanically. Um, but back to the mail. Uh, one day in January 2013 on YouTube, I came across the movie Pumping Iron. I watched it and thoroughly enjoyed it, and it motivated me to start weight training. I was 41. So this is sort of to Phil's point about getting older and some of the changes. I was 41, and even though uh, I was late to the party, I really got into it, and I changed my body shape for the better, and people noticed For the last eight months or so, I haven't felt myself lately. After I put the symptoms together, I realized my testosterone was probably low and and it needed to be checked. I went to the doctor and sure enough, his testosterone, I won't give you all the numbers, but it was was below the normal that a lot of doctors set at 300. Now, this was the email that I mentioned earlier, everybody, about, you know, when I was saying somebody's going to come out of the woodwork and blame Phil for having uh, some advantage. (laughs) <laughs> um, so this is mostly about like testosterone replacement therapy and would it give you an unfair advantage? So, but I digress. Now at 45, I have to consider TRT, right? Test replacement therapy. 
uh, I'll probably be on it for some 20 years. Have you ever done a show on it? Uh, I checked the show history. I didn't find any episode dealing with it specifically, but I'm sure some of your listeners are in a similar boat as me. It's becoming far more common than it used to be, and I'll agree with that. Um, if I was a competitive lifter, would I be banned from competing in certain meets? A quick Google search turned up only uh, some MMA fighter that was banned from competing for test replacement therapy. Again, we're talking about like androgel and stuff, people. We're not talking about, you know, necessarily at least, intramuscular injections that get your, your T levels sky high, you know. Um, anyway, he found that strange. Although testosterone is a steroid, it isn't prescribed at the dosage that anabolic steroids typically are for the same types of patients. Obviously, uh, on the black market, that kind of thing. Uh, none of that matters, but that's a different discussion. I believe a show on testosterone replacement therapy would be very interesting for many of your listeners. Think about that uh, and keep up the really great work. Pete. So, um, Phil, what do you think? Uh, someone, they're mid-40s, right? So, to me, I think of the analogy of diabetes. If you, if you don't have functioning insulin, you need to take some, you know, um, and, in that, and nobody would question a diabetic taking their insulin. But if you've got low T and you take medicine for it, I don't know. Uh, what, are, what are the different um, organizations like? Because there's so many power organizations right now. And I'd actually have to look at the bodybuilding stuff. Um, would they ban someone for just test replacement therapy, like androgel or something? Well, I can tell you this. The USPA just had their first – they just started – a uh, tested, uh, what would it be called? Uh, not the whole feds tested, but they have a tested division. And they just banned their first person is because of TRT. Oh, man. Uh, oh. So, uh, so, yeah, I mean, in certain federations, yes. But they also have a non-tested, and they're like, it's right in our rules. It's not allowed. And this guy thought it was, and they said he didn't read the rules. So, um, yeah, you can be. <clears throat> um Okay, interesting. So, but, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm on the fence about it, and that's, like, I've openly been on replacement therapy for a while. Um, and, you know, one of the things, that was one of the things I had to, to deal with. Like, before I went to the Worlds years ago, I called up and talked to the guy. And he's like, well, you can enter this or you can enter that. He said, it's, it's up to you um, which way you go, because it wasn't banned in that federation. But I went ahead and went in the open. Uh, because, I don't know, to me, I don't really see it as cheating, but in the same sense, if you're training really, really, really hard, and, well, let's say two people are training really, really, really hard, one person's on replacement therapy and one person's not, um, let's say they're both having to cut for a meat, so now we add in diet, too. The person that's on replacement therapy, their, their levels won't fall at all, whereas the yes. person that isn't, it probably will. Yep. So... In in that way, yeah, that's kind of a sticky situation. You know what I'm saying? I mean, basically, you're you're not above normal, but you don't have the same. Your 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 levels won't vary naturally like somebody who is under under extreme stress. Right. You know what, Phil? The um the uh, the analogy in um or the parallel in bodybuilding, I think, is a lot of guys who compete if they go on a very low fat. Uh, low cal diet. Mm -hmm. There's some good evidence out there that those sorts of diets will can cut your testosterone levels like 15 percent. Now again, we're talking within a normal range, and we've had discussions mm -hmm. before. And Mike's very familiar with this literature too. That you know, bumping things up and down, let's say on a thousand scale within a normal range, um, is not going to make you look like the cover of a magazine or not. But it's a good point. If you're on test replacement therapy, you could do one of those l low cal, progressive, low fat diets, and your testosterone levels could be humming along at 800, right? Yep. And they would yeah, not it'll fall. Be fun. Yeah, you know? yeah, <sighs> yeah. So, what about you, Doctor Nelson? Any thoughts on that? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, a couple of things. Like you guys were saying that if I looked at this years ago, I wrote an, an article for uh, uh, Testosterone <laughs> magazine, primarily <laughs> on uh, does lifting boost testosterone. And I was trying to find some data that would say, okay, if you're in the normal range, which for simple math we'll say is like 300 to 900, it's not the exact numbers, but within there, mm -hmm. is there any advantage to being on the higher end of normal or the low end of normal? Um, so Bazin had one study, the author, B-H-A-S-I-N, who did a lot of the 
early work on anabolics in the 90s and <clears throat> they chemically castrated men so they gave him a drug to block basically any testosterone and then they supplemented him back and tried to get someone at you know lowish normal and highish normal and in that study they didn't see any huge difference but they also didn't change training volume and stress and you know like you guys were saying basically push more stress on someone either so i think the biggest thing is that it may help <clears throat> with uh, recovery with you know stress and things of that so you can possibly train a little bit more train a little bit harder you know on lower calories things of that nature mm -hmm. um if I were him, like I, personally, I haven't done uh, testosterone replacement therapy. I'm not against it at all per se. It's you know each person do whatever you want. But the people who ask me about it, the two questions I always tell them to go back and talk to their doctor about are: Do we know the reason that it's low? Because if <clears throat> you're super high stress or you've got something else that's off, just adding more testosterone to me is just like putting gas on a fire. It's like, ooh, the fire is bigger, but, you know, mm -hmm. why was the fire small to begin with? Mm -hmm. um, so see if you can maybe look at what is kind of the root cause of that. And, you know, at that point you may decide that, you know, it's a good option or not. Um, the other question is I would ask him, well, what did you do if you ever decide you want to go off? They usually mm -hmm. find that in general – better physicians will have an idea of what to do at that point. If they're like, ah, just take it the rest of your life. Eh, that doesn't make me feel real confident because uh, unfortunately now there's not every physician, but there's some physicians who just want to solve every issue by prescribing testosterone mm -hmm. to every person who walks in the door. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I know I've talked about this in the show when I was doing my PhD I had my testosterone measured a couple times and, it was in like the 200s and I knew it was because of, you know, I was sleeping five and a half hours a night. I was working, you know, 10, 12, 15 hours a day for weeks and months on end. So I knew it was a, a more stress related thing and lifestyle related. So, but I'm sure I probably could have gone in and said, you know, Hey, look at my numbers. They're like, Oh, that's horrible. You need this androgel or whatever. Um, but the issue was related to lifestyle and stress and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So right. that's my advice. Yeah, we should do a no, whole I, episode, yeah. I think, sometime. on. There's so many good yeah. questions. Yeah. I mean, I agree. And, I, and one of the things that you brought up is that. I mean, find out why. And yeah. that was the first thing that I tell people, and that's the first thing I did. Like, I came in extremely low. I came in at a 42. Oh. Uh, Holy yeah. crap. And the doctor was like, I have never seen this. Um, <laughs> so, and he was like, okay, here you go. And I was like, well, well no, let's figure out why. Yeah. You know, so we had to go through MRIs and this and this and this. And this. But, I mean, I wanted to know the root cause. You know, right, yeah. Of what's going on. So, And most people don't do that. They're just like, okay, give me the pill. You yeah. Know, let's find out why first and if there's anything we can do about it. Yeah, I do so, think, I mean, having known bodybuilders, for example, who foolishly, they would they would just go off cold turkey after they compete. And then, mm -hmm. and you know, then, of course, if <clears throat> back in the day, before there was TRT more commonly used. And I, I get what you're saying, Mike, about the flip side is that it could be overprescribed. But yeah. I used to watch guys get talk about not treating the root cause. Clearly, they had no oh, testosterone. Yeah. So if we stop it at testosterone as the mechanism, I remember one guy in particular, uh, mesomorphic guy, competed at a you know, regional level uh, and went off cold turkey. And so instead of getting any kind of replacement, because before the androgel, before I think a lot of like the politicians and power broker middle age guys started seeing some of the benefits, this was very taboo. It was akin to doping in every way. And they put him on like an antidepressant, uh, oh. which, which is actually going to make his increasing body fat even worse. Right. Yeah. Um, they put him on Viagra so he could have erections, even though he had no drive. You know, so he's got like this functioning machinery with no desire to use it kind of thing. <laughs> and, and so, but you know, how bizarre is this, right? The, the doctors are, they're prescribing everything under the sun to give him artificial sexual function and, uh, yeah. and mood and that kind of stuff. Instead of saying, my God, man, your testosterone is, is rock bottom, you know, and whether he did it to himself or not. You know, that could have been the bridge over troubled water. So anyway, I don't want to get into too much. I, I actually have a, a friend of mine in Akron, he's an endocrinologist, he's a medical doctor, and he, um, he's like, there's essentially no abuse potential for androgel, is his, his argument, because you'd have to bathe in the stuff. 
and you're barely ever going to get your levels just maybe a little bit over a thousand. You know, you're never going to get those sort of five times physiological no. levels. That, you know, that um, like a PED type of dose, supra physiologic. And he argues that that's why one of the reasons it's so common. Now, a lot of doctors give shots too. So, like I said, this is a whole. I, I think you, the, the listener, you're right, man. This is a whole show. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is because I could go on. So. Right. Yeah. For <laughs> yeah. sure. Um, for sure. Okay. Um, I have one last little bit of news. I think I'm going to table it because we've already kind of we're just having a shoot the shit episode. Maybe that's obvious, um, but we're going to go to break. We're going to come back uh, and we'll talk about giving back. So we'll be uh, right back. Hey listeners, this is Dr. Lonnie Lowry. If you've ever had anyone critique you uh, on your protein intake as part of your weightlifting lifestyle, oh you poor meathead, all that extra protein is going to rot your kidneys or weaken your bones or dehydrate you or give you gout or who knows what. Uh, there is a book available. You could simply Google CRC Press and Lowry. And what I've done is reach out to experts all over the world and create a book, a single compendium that you can hold up and say, this is why I consume extra protein. This can be very valuable when you're um, being quote unquote educated uh, by various professionals on the topic. Uh, there's enormous amount of literature in this book on the safety, uh, the effectiveness, how protein works in cells, the history of protein and weight trainers, uh, much more. So again, please check out CRC Press and Protein and Lowry. You can just Google that. And uh, I do, full disclosure, I do make a small single digit royalty on the book. But that's not why I did it. I did it so we can all have something, uh, our particular population, uh, to both defend what we do and to inform our nutrition and our eating. Thanks. I can't stop feeling. Some of us don't understand how lucky we are to be living in this Hi listeners, this is Rob Fortress Fortney. I'm here to remind you that as the holiday season approaches and your thoughts turn to giving, we like you to keep Iron Rated in your thoughts. Over the past several years, there have been hundreds of listener comments hoping that Iron Radio stays on the air for years to come. Iron Radio is here for you. But as with any public radio type format, the show is listener supported. That's where you come in. For just $4 a month, you become a supporting member, keeping your weekly dose of education, experts, and gym talk flowing. Just go to www.ironradio.org and click on the $4 monthly subscribe button near the bottom of the page. Or... Click the Donate button at the right of the page for a one-time donation. You are the Iron Brotherhood and Sisterhood. Of course, not everyone can afford to be a supporting member or a significant one-time donor. But for those of you willing to pitch in $4 per month or $50 just once, we're about to sweeten the deal. Become a supporting member or major donor between now and January, and a limited number of you will receive a gift worth over $20. And we will never forget our existing supporters. Simply email me via ironradio.org and I'll send you a free seminar from Dr. Lowry on how to significantly and realistically boost your testosterone levels. Help your iron brothers and sisters who cannot pitch in but deserve better internet programming in our sports. And happy holidays. Iron Radio is, of course, primarily a podcast. But over the years, there have been technical glitches calling for backup streaming and listeners who wanted the convenience of other sources of audio content. Toward this end, Iron Radio is now simulcast and backed up on YouTube. If needed, please search Lawnman07 or Iron Radio from within YouTube. There's not much video, but if you like to listen through YouTube on a Roku or other living room device, there you go. Like your weekly fix of Iron Radio? In addition to being a popular institute on iTunes, we are also on email. Simply go to www.ironradio.org, 
and sign up for the voluntary email. You'll get a once per week email, no more, that's little more than the show notes and a link to the audio. So go for it. All right, folks, we're back. It's Phil and Mike and Lonnie, and we're going to talk about giving back. Uh, not just because fall is a common time for people to start thinking about supporting their favorite causes and that sort of thing, but what is it about you guys as our lifters, or our listeners who are also lifters, uh, that you might use to your advantage, right? It seems like an added level of cool to be able to take some of your abilities, because let's face it, uh, Iron Radio listeners are... They're practically superheroes com compared to the average sedentary American. So what could we do uh, to give back? And let me give you an example I've mentioned on the show before. I think we all have. Um, but one would be like blood donations. Like mm. uh, genetically, the men in my family, we have very high hematocrit, high hemoglobin. Uh, I'm even O negative blood type, which is a you know universal donor. So I go donate regularly. I figure, A, it's doing myself a favor. Because there's some interesting comments about iron overload slowly happening in men. I mean, much less of an issue in women, of course, because of their monthly cycle and period and losing blood and that sort of thing. But, um, or, you know, if you are, let's say you're on TRT. And now that's, the, the gels aren't supposed to raise your hematocrit as high as injectable stuff and that sort of thing. But let's say you do run high testosterone. You have very rich blood, for lack of a better way to say that. You know, your hematocrits are pretty high. Um, that would be a really advantageous thing to do. Um, a, kind of do yourself a favor, but also, I mean, we're always joking, you know, especially guys that I've known in the past who used androgens and stuff. They're like, man, you know, they give my blood to some old lady after surgery. She's going to jump up off the table and jog down the hall, you know, start <laughs> curling the surgeon. I don't know. Uh, and that, that is kind of a funny uh, idea. And I'm sure... Uh, People at the Red Cross, they might say, no, we don't want you on a different, you know, certainly using uh, injectables and th that sort of thing. We, d we can't use your blood because of certain risks. And I get that. But that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about, you know, built up abilities that would allow us to sort of give back in a special way. And before we hit the record button, everybody, um, Phil and Mike were both talking about at getting asked to move. Uh, so, <laughs> hey, uh, Phil, you're big. You know, I got furniture yeah. help, right? So, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. You've been asked to do that, right, Phil? Uh, yeah, there's horror stories about this. But, um, like, me and my buddy were talking about this just this last week because he had to go help somebody move. And so he was telling his worst story of it ever. And he, his mom called him and said he had to help his sister move. So, like most siblings, they don't always get along. But he shows up to move his sister, and she's not there. And he's like, where's she at? Well, she's on a float trip. It's like, oh, no. No, that's not going to happen. <laughs> if I help somebody move, oh, you better be there. But, right. Uh, you're helping. You're not taking over. Yeah. Yeah. It's sure. always that. You know, like, well, you're big and strong. You can help. It's easy for you. No, no, it sucks. You know, right. I, don't, I don't go to the gym so I can help you move. <laughs> you know? no, right. Exactly. But. Now, you do a lot of functional stuff, too. I, I was bitching before we re recorded anything about getting sore in weird ways because you're doing odd lifts essentially you know you're doing yeah. all this weird stuff that requires grip like this might be something dr mm -hmm. nelson's really good at but you know i'm not usually training that kind of stuff so you get weird in the sore in these like weird assister muscles you didn't have you know and stuff like that and i can tell you man i mean when i moved back from minnesota i did the, my whole house myself and i was wrecked for like two oh, yeah. or three days when i got home because, you know, you're talking about hours and hours up and down the truck with carrying everything from a couch. You look like an ant. You know, you're balancing the couch just <laughs> right on your back. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it, 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 it takes a weird toll. But, Mike, you've been hit up for that kind of stuff too, right? I mean, you're a big guy. Yeah, not as much lately, <clears throat> which is good. I, before the show, we were saying that I had one many, many years ago, a long time ago, when I first moved back to the cities and finished college the first time. And they said, oh, we're going to help us. I'm like, okay, fine. And I showed up, and we did not move the first thing until seven hours later. So and I wrong. wanted to kill somebody. Oh, my God. Because um, I asked them beforehand, okay, you're going to have everything ready. I'll help you move. But the deal is I'm not putting stuff in boxes. Yes. One, because you don't need me to do that. Two, I'm afraid I'm going to break something. And three, it's you can find other people to do that, right? If you mm -hmm. wanted to help me move, I'll help you move stuff. But... 
Yeah, and then <clears throat> one of them went a couple of years ago. We live at a townhouse, and <clears throat> most of the training I do is in the garage. A lot of times we're out in the middle of the street because the street just dead ends. And I was uh, gone. My wife answered the door. One of the neighbor ladies had come over, and she's like, oh, is the other guy who does all that weird stuff lifting in the street, is he home? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And she's like, no. She's like, oh, I was wondering if he could help me take a box upstairs. I just had cancer treatment, and I can't move anything. Oh, it's man. Like, oh. Yeah. So my wife's like, well, I'm pretty strong. I can see if I can do it. And she was able to help her out. <laughs> oh, good. Good. So, uh, yeah. It's yeah, so there's lots of ideas. I mean, stuff. sometimes it's your knowledge base, right? Like, for example, we have listeners. Some are farm D's, coaches, teachers. You could do something like give a free local library lecture or something like that, or a Q&A on weight management or something. Wouldn't be that hard, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I do a lot of stuff with food banks. Uh, I just did one. Uh, I'd say about once a year uh, I get involved with the food bank, and that could be everything from uh, just understanding, the, you know, on a deeper level the need for – the right kind of nutrition or food insecurity. Sometimes it's back to the sort of the moving thing and it's hauling whole pallets of cans. That's heavy shit, man. I'm telling you, you know, uh, moving stuff around like that. So walks, charity walks. My wife and I just did a one for opiate uh, abuse, you know, and addiction because that's what she does. And I mean, God knows our listeners could do any number of one of these runs or walks or some, you know, the physical type things. Uh, that raise money. So it's not always throwing your own money at things, I, you know, I would argue. It could even be something like partnering up or with a, a noob or mentoring a noob in the gym, you know, uh, so they're not spinning their wheels as bad. I mean, I guess they could listen to Iron Radio. <laughs> but um, there's lots of things I, I think that, that people can do yeah. to give back. For sure. I mean, one of the ways I do it is I, I donate my time, my facility to Special Olympics. You know, oh right. We help. I we help coach the Special Olympics team, powerlifting team in this area, and that's all. You know, it's it's donated time and space and everything like that. So, um, and it's good. I mean, you can search those out anywhere. There's always going to be kids interested in that, and there's usually a huge lack of knowledge in the area. Oh, so, yeah. um, you, you go to one of those meets, it's like, oh, it looks horrible. It's like, well, let me help you guys. <laughs> 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 so, um. Yeah, things like that. And I That's mean, a good one. Doing things for local high schools and things like that. So Yeah, how many of our listeners um, probably also have a studio or a facility or you know some way to train people themselves? Yeah, opening that up to kids, for example. Yeah. yeah. That's a great idea. Or special populations. That's a really good one. Dr. Nelson, I, I know you give a lot of like free lectures and stuff uh, like on the professional level. You ever do anything uh, on the charitable side like that? Yeah. Uh... Yeah, I have in the past. Um, it just depends on where it's for and that type of thing. And, yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting in fitness. So there's some organizations I've presented for multiple years that I don't make any money at all. It costs me money because I have to pay for my own hotel, pay for my own flight and everything too. Oh, so, right, right. And, you know, I do it because I enjoy doing it. I like the people who you know founded the organization and I, I think it's a good thing to do. Yeah, maybe get you know a few clients out of it, possibly you know here and there. Um, but I think there's some kind of interesting thing in fitness where people are like, "Oh, if you present, you make a ton of money." It's like, nah, not so much in fitness, really. Per se, no, right? Per it's se. not like you're Hillary Clinton making like eighty grand no. for a half an hour or something or more. No, even when you do get paid, it's yeah, it's not a lot, but it helps. Um, I've done other things in the past, like uh, the MS150. So it's a bike ride from the Twin Cities to Duluth, Minnesota. So I've done that a few times, and it's super interesting because at the end, you know, it's you're not riding fast. It's not a race, but you're riding 75 miles a day. The worst part is your butt just hurts so bad, but <laughs> it's kind of not so fun at the end, and I don't train enough for it. So, um, but it's pretty crazy to see you know all the people at the end who you know can't even ride a bike. You know, so I'm finishing it and going, wow, I can ride a bike. These people can't do anything like that, you know, so right, I don't have exactly. any reason to really complain of that my butt's going to be sore for, <laughs> for right. a few days. Like so. a sore butt, what's that? To, to us, we're always sore, you know, I mean, okay, yeah. sore in another spot, I, but yeah, you're physically able to do something, you know. 
Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think that's to me like the things I've done like that are. I think it's just a change in your perspective, um, and I think you know getting injured yourself will do something similar. But I think volunteering and do other things like that, you can get a perspective shift without being injured. You know, because you get injured, all of a sudden you appreciate just all the crappy days you had at the gym. You know, I remember pulling my hip flexors saying that I'm never going to complain about a bad day in the gym because at least I got to do something to walk yeah. around like a stranded penguin. Um, so I think volunteering for other organizations, you can get a similar feeling, a little bit change in, in perspective too, and you don't have to go through the pain of being injured. Yeah, I like that a lot. Uh, when I did a little bit, and I haven't done much, but I've done a little bit of work at what some might call a soup kitchen or a food pantry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're working with some of those clients, and I think people have a perspective of them, like maybe they're they're sort of the, <laughs> I don't know, hobo with a shotgun kind of thing, you know, like the, <laughs> the, the cheesy film. This is not, these people, sometimes they're homeless, and they're just someone who, they didn't land on their feet after that last job. Like, they're, they're so, yeah. like, middle class kind of people that just need a bridge over troubled water you know there it's not that stereotype at all and i admit that that changed my perspective now that was years ago i was actually um the one time i'm thinking about when i was fairly young i was in my uh, 30s and i'm like you know this is not what i thought i had a really wrong perception it really did change my my perspective you know about who the clients were that needed the food at that point you know so it, it does it helps you grow as a person as as you give back, I guess. So, I mean, that's why we do Iron Radio, right? Mm -hmm. We it's a it's an we're not we're not raking in the bucks to do this when yeah. when people <laughs> get involved with our fall funds drive, you know, the like supporting members, which is like the four dollars a month thing, or they just make a donation. That's hugely appreciated. So we can keep giving this out for free, right? So that's important, and, and not just Iron Radio. If you're involved with a, if you listen to a podcast or something like that, think about supporting them. Put your money where you want it, right, where your um, interests lie and your concerns lie and support those kinds of things. Sometimes it is with a little bit of money, you know, or uh, you could support things like your favorite podcast or YouTube channel or something with a, a, a review, you know, mm -hmm. so the word gets out and people are like, hey, you know, this is this is worthwhile. So, yeah. yeah. And that's one thing I'm doing with the new uh, flex diet certification is that ten percent of the gross profits will actually be donated back to science, so helping fund different labs and because as we know, politics aside, just performance funding is pretty low on the list, right? So, and all the times I think we've looked at those things, there's other benefits that we just don't know about, right? And you can cite creatine to you know different even weight training, all those types of research that on its face looks like it's only performance-based. And then we figure out, oh, wow, muscle is super helpful for combating sarcopenia as you age. And, you know, creatine may be helpful for neurologic issues. And I think there's a lot of transfer uh, from that, too. So very much to, to help those labs. Yeah, I'm a huge support, you know, basic research. It doesn't look like it has yeah. an immediate application. But who's to say right. that that doesn't lead to the cure for Alzheimer's or cancer or something somehow down the road? You know, a, a nutrient, yeah. a supplement, a training mm -hmm. program, you know, whatever it is. And in fact, Iron Radio, it, we don't generate a lot of funds. But uh, if we ever have a few hundred dollars here or there at the end of a given year, sometimes we'll try to, uh, you know, support an athlete you know sort of like a, a mini sponsorship or a, 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 one of my students for example i might say you know i can help pay for your hotel while you go present some of this stuff because like you said mike some of this stuff is it's not as frivolous as just a bigger bench bro you know yeah not, not that there's anything <laughs> wrong with that but yeah. yeah for sure all right i think that's i think that's an episode all right guys thanks a lot cool yeah thank you Hey listeners, have you seen the store at ironradio.org? There are three halls in the store. One for Phil, one for Fortress, and one for myself, Dr. Lowry. And they're thematic. So you can go into our Halls of Iron store and choose based on your goal. If you need something to learn or read or something nutritional, you can look in my store. Uh, Lonnie's store. If you want something about injury prevention, 
uh, or competition, then take a look at Phil's Hall of Iron. And if you want something about motivation or daily training, Fortress's Hall has what you're looking for. There are some fun, heroic descriptors uh, as you browse through the stores. We try to make it a little more fun than the average boring online store. And whether you're a novice lifter or someone more experienced, you can take heart that you're not wasting your time. The things that we put in each hall of iron are actually based on our own recommendations. Protein powders that we know to be good, uh, knee sleeves, wraps of some kind, things that Fortress uses in his own training. Uh, the stuff you, you see, you know is good. This way you don't waste time. So check out the Iron Radio store at ironradio.org and um, let us know what you think on the forums and certainly you can request products and we will uh, screen them before they go in. So thanks for listening. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding, um, please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org uh, store. Uh, we also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.